my name is Amelia Long. I'm a researcher here at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and an editor of our blog, The Strategist. I'm joined today by Peter Jennings, the Executive Director here at ASPE. Hi, Amelia. So, Peter, unresolved tensions over foreign investment and the South China Sea has seen increased discussion of China's use of soft power or influence building here in Australia. So the term soft power has been thrown around quite a lot recently, um, especially following Senator Sam Dastyari's resignation from the front bench. Do you consider China's recent actions to be soft power or active statecraft? Well, the term soft power goes really back to uh, a book written by um, Harvard academic Joe Nye in the 1990s. And um, I, I think you can see it as a form of statecraft. Um, it's, it's really talking about the instruments of power that a country can bring to bear beyond the use of military force. And in the case of China, I think we're, we're now seeing um, the rolling out of a type of soft power which is possible because of the enormous wealth which China has grown over um, a generation now of uh, economic uh, uh, strengthening. Um, where it becomes, uh, I think, problematic and, and, and what a number of countries in the, in the Asia Pacific in particular are focusing on is, is the extent to which this may lead to um, uh, what, what seem to be as unwarranted interference by China in the domestic politics of, of other countries. And so the examples that I think come to mind in Australia recently would be, uh, you know, what appears to be large volumes of financial donations to Australian political parties, which come from Chinese companies that have links back to the uh, central government in Beijing. Um, and then on top of that, things like uh, what appears to be um, uh, Chinese money funding institutes at Australian uh, universities, where it just so happens that the institute is actually producing material that is, you know, consistently of a line that suits the policy, the desired policy outcomes of, uh, of the Chinese government. Um, now, you know, this has been headline material in Australia, but in fact, if you read the Canadian newspapers, you'll see exactly the same stories playing out there in terms of financial donations. I, I think this is a problem. Um, it's not to say that other countries don't try and influence the, the thinking and behaviour of, of, of uh, countries through, through use of soft power. And the, the cultural attractiveness of Hollywood or Bollywood, for example, is often seen to be a soft power of the United States and, and of India. Uh, where I think China is a little different though is it seems to have a very sharp political focus. It, it often comes with money and strings attached and I think that's got people worried in Australia at the moment. Do you see there being any limits of this kind of Chinese leverage um, in Australia currently and what trends do you think are making it particularly effective or ineffective? Well, uh, uh, money goes a long way to buying influence. I think there's no question about that, and, and that certainly has been the, the, the story of the uh, Sam Dastyari uh, matter, uh, where it seemed that uh, you know here we had an Australian politician with a, with a very direct set of relations with Chinese business to whom he could um, apparently um, say, well, would you mind paying some, some bills for me? Um, I, I guess the, qu the, the question that goes beyond that is, well, how, how isolated is that event? Is this something that is more widely operating within the Australian political system? And there's some evidence to suggest that there is a problem there because we know now um, uh, there's been uh, uh, reports of millions of dollars worth of uh, money being donated to Australian political parties. And generally speaking, I, I think you know this isn't happening um, as a result of altruism so much as it is a belief um, that's very much a part of uh, Chinese culture. That you know, with gift giving comes comes influence and, and a sense of uh, mutual obligation. So um, I, I I think that uh, what what is really required here is for governments to look carefully at this situation to sort of make clear to China what's acceptable and what's unacceptable from a point of view of how our domestic politics operates. And I don't think we should imagine that it's only happening in Australia. I think we need to look at experiences in the South Pacific, uh, in Southeast Asia and further afield where a similar pattern is also observable. So how is China's um, soft power influence regarded internationally? 
Well, it's quite funny because uh, for all of the uh, uh, um, amount of uh, wealth that's been invested through Chinese aid programs, for example, and it would have to be said that it's not necessarily bought too many hearts uh, and minds in the region. And uh, you know, one observation I would make about that is that if you if you look at the South Pacific, Solomon Islands is an example where. Um, uh, there's, there's quite a degree of resentment against local Chinese communities. It's, it's often the Chinatown which is the first thing to be put to the torch when there's instability in, in Tonga or the Solomons. Um, I think this puzzles China about how it is that its growth of wealth hasn't actually translated into a kind of a positive appreciation of uh, Chinese cultural values, for example that might be said to have been uh, what the US has achieved through its uh, sort of cultural diplomacy since the end of the, the Second World War. Um, and, and in a sense, I think part of China's frustration about this is now leading to what I would uh, call you know, a much more overt use of money to try to buy influence in some, in some countries. Um, does this work? Um, I guess is the key question here. It's hard, it's hard to know. Um, if you're not winning hearts and minds, I think there's probably limits to what financial um, inducement will be able to achieve. Uh, but everywhere, what it really does tell you is that the power of the Chinese economy is now something that's of desperate interest to most countries around the world. So you, you did recently write for The Australian that, um, that this inability to win the hearts and minds is causing frustrations in um, the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think that President Xi Jinping is operating from a position of weakness? I think that, um, well, there is always in China a sort of a curious sense both of strength and of weakness. And um, I, I think one of the chief motivators for the, the Communist Party of China is, of course, how to stay in power, how, how to marshal the instincts of the Chinese population in a way which supports the position of the Communist Party rather than uh, puts it at risk. And um, if you understand Chinese history, you can probably see why there is a degree of, of, of worry on the part of, uh, of the Communist Party. Because China is a country which has uh, five times in the last century and a little bit changed its political system and, uh, dramatically. And, and usually at the price of you know, deep um, instability and, and massive bloodshed. So I think there is always that sense of fear that partly motivates Chinese politicians around um, how they can strengthen their own internal domestic situation. That's the weakness part. The strength part, of course, is the growth of the Chinese economy uh, and the fact that you know this has now turned China into the number one trading partner for, I, I forget the number, but I think it's something like 80 or 90 countries around the world. And of course, there's no doubt that that degree of economic strength does buy influence. Um, the question is, how does China translate that now into um, political advantage for itself? That's the bit that I think they're struggling with. Now, Xi Jinping, as, as the inheritor of all of this, uh, as, as the president of China since uh, 2012, I think has taken a much more overt um, approach to saying, we're no longer going to do what Deng Xiaoping called for, which was hide and buy hide our capabilities and bide our time. Xi Jinping is now saying, you know, we are here to actually um, promote a strong China around the world. And um, this is what's causing tensions in the South China Sea. It's what's causing a complex and difficult relationship between Washington and Beijing. And I think you can trace that to, uh, into the domestic political experience in Australia, where it's also now leading to questions being asked about well, is this influence buying really appropriate? So we're experiencing a bit of a bumpy patch in the road between Australia and China. Yes. Um, how do we move forward from that? Um, I think it's always going to be challenging because there's disparities in size, um, primarily economic size. But I think um, what Australia needs to do is to take um, a fairly clear uh, line with China about what we think our key strategic interests are. Uh, my, my own experience of negotiating with um, senior PLA officials over a number of years when I was in the Defence Department is that they tended to respect a position, if you could put to them, which said this is our strategic interests and we don't intend to divert from promoting those interests. On the other hand, I think if you open up a, um, uh, a, a position whereby you're prepared to compromise 
in uh, negotiations on issues with China. Their tendency is to want to take every concession that you're prepared to, to offer to them, uh, perhaps not unreasonably from, from their perspective. So I think the first thing we have to do is to make clear to China that there are some things on which we aren't going to compromise. And they would include things like um, our interests in the South China Sea, where 80% um, of our merchandise trade travels across the South China Sea in ships. That clearly gives us a strategic interest in freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. I think another area where we probably can't afford to compromise uh, in terms of our relations with China is, is over the US defence alliance relationship. I mean, we know uh, every, everyone uh, that has talked to uh, Chinese officials over the years will say, well, we regard alliances as a Cold War, outmoded Cold War construct and, and we should get rid of them. Um, I don't think Australia is ever really going to be prepared to walk away from the US alliance. And saying that to the Chinese in fairly direct terms, I don't think actually does us any damage. So knowing our strategic interests and being prepared to know when we have to hold a line uh, when it comes to negotiations, I think is the right way to deal with China. And, and of course doing this respectfully, but being clear about where our interest lies. Okay, thank you very much for your time, Peter. It's my pleasure, thank you.